Well, good evening. Welcome to Yada Yada Radio. I'm here with uh, Kirk and uh, and Dee. There's some items in the news we'll cover here uh, briefly. Um, one of the things that, that we talked about, uh, about the United States uh, getting involved in Afghanistan, not only did I predict before we actually invaded Afghanistan that it would be a lose-lose proposition, that we would make a bad situation worse, and it did not matter if we stayed there for 10 years or 100 years, uh, the country would be worse off uh, for our time once we left. And that is exactly what occurred. But the other thing I said is that in the vacuum of of what America has done after having spent many, many tens, uh, if not hundreds of billions of dollars, and I think the number ultimately with those two wars is $4 trillion, that we will simply invite the Chinese to take advantage. Uh, Afghanistan is very rich not only in minerals, but its location is such that it is an ideal site for pipelines uh, to bring oil and gas uh, from the uh, the Caspian Sea region to a free water port. Uh, but it's also a rich with uh, all kinds of, uh, of rare earth elements. And so the Chinese were certain to take advantage of America's blunder. You know, there was more recently a hotel attack in, um, in Afghanistan where the Islamic State bombed uh, facilities that were controlled by the Taliban. Muslims just don't get along with each other, even fundamentalists. But in that attack, five Chinese nationals were wounded. They have moved in. Wow. Uh, and being communist, they have no moral compass. And therefore, they have no issue dealing with the Taliban. The fact that the Taliban abuse women, that uh, they are intolerant of any religion other than Islam and don't even accept any form of Islam other than their own, the Chinese don't care. Chinese don't care how brutal the regime is or how they came to power. That is the nature of communists, which is why uh, we ought not be partnering with them. The Knesset is... uh, and Israel is up in arms uh, because there are uh, uh, many elements of the religious bloc that Netanyahu represents uh, that want to change the law of return. Uh, And they want to change the law of return to uh, make it such that the only way you can come to Israel and become a citizen and thus vote is that if you have ultra-Orthodox rabbinical credentials. What they want to do is build up their control of the Knesset and therefore parliament and, uh, and uh, should be, therefore the, the offices of the prime minister and control the government. And the Knesset is universally uh, opposed to it apart from the ultra-Orthodox religious factions. And it will fundamentally change Israel if yeah. Uh, yeah. this uh, Netanyahu uh, alliance for him to to get them all to sign up to be part of his government and then to stay part of his government, uh, if he has to continue to give them the kind of uh, concessions they are demanding, including an overthrow of the judiciary branch. Uh, including changing the laws on Shabbat so that it doesn't matter if you want to to go to the beach or not. You can't. You want to ride a bus or not. You can't. Uh, the religious dictating the behavior of, uh, of those who are not religious. And it'll be interesting to see how uh, Netanyahu deals with this because these are the people he chose to climb in bed with. Speaking of wrong people to climb in bed with, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission charged the disgraced and bankrupt cryptocurrency former tycoon, Sam uh, Bankman Fried, on uh, Tuesday of this past week with defrauding customers of billions of dollars. He was arrested and extradited out of the Bahamas. What he did makes uh, Bernie Madoff look like uh, he was playing uh, with the children at Romper Room. Speaking of uh, of fraud, uh, the European Parliament, uh, particularly Vice President Eva Kiley, uh, and she's a pretty little blonde thing, you would say, 
boy, if you were to go up against her, you would have all sorts of libertarians all over you. Not libertarians, actually, libertards. Uh, she uh, pocketed money. She's actually in jail now. She pocketed money on behalf of Qatar so that any legislation in the European Union pertaining to Qatar would be favorable to Qatar. Qatar is the country that bribed their way into hosting the uh, uh, the FIFA uh, World Cup, and now they uh, are bribing European officials. Again, the problem is that systems of uh, of governance that are controlled by people with uh, no morals, and uh, progressives have no moral basis. There is literally no morality, no sense of justice or uh, being discerning uh, amongst uh, progressives. And so this is part of their problem. And, of course, in Islam, it is a wholly uh, immoral uh, religion. Uh, Jack Dorsey was formerly the CEO of uh, Twitter. And he um, has admitted that the decisions that he made in terms of of, uh, of banning two things uh, during his stay, one is banning uh, the President of the United States uh, from using Twitter, and then banning anyone prior to the election uh, uh, associating anything negative with Joe Biden based upon the reprehensible behavior of Hunter Biden. And he has said, it was the right thing to do for Twitter, but the wrong thing to do for the Internet and society. Uh, you know, at least he's two-thirds right. It was the wrong thing to do for the Internet and society, but it was always also the wrong thing to do for Twitter. But it is interesting to see the former CEO of that company admit that what he did was inappropriate. Uh, yeah. I noticed even in our chat room, there was uh, uh, one of my favorite people was criticizing uh, uh, Elon Musk for banning journalists on uh, Twitter. That's, that really is a, uh, a, a tiny bit of the story. Um, the, the problem that Elon Musk had, uh, he should not have had, but nonetheless... Uh, smart people sometimes do dumb things. Uh, he had a number of libertards who decided that he is just uh, a reprehensible human being. It's interesting, too, that Elon Musk voted for Biden. He wishes he hadn't, but nonetheless, he is not a conservative. Uh, he, I mean, he votes Democratic. Uh, but he uh, uh, has opted out of the universal progressive control of the media, uh, and wants a more free speech platform. His uh, uh, rules, however, are um, um, uh, do exist, and that uh, you spend $43 billion on something, you are entitled to uh, establish uh, your own rules for your own company that you paid for. Uh, in this particular <laughs> case, his issue was that uh, some people were trolling him. They were uh, uh, trying to broadcast his location so that other libertards could harass him. Uh, and they were doing so by uh, tracking his airplane. Now, other libertards are saying all they're doing is publishing uh, public information. Uh, while that may be true, uh, that it's publicly available, uh, most libertards don't do much research, uh, so it might have been beyond them. And by publishing it on Twitter, they were encouraging many people uh, who have social networking skills to go and harass and worse uh, Elon Musk and his family. Now, I had a problem uh, when I was uh, getting uh, divorced of my ex trying to track me everywhere. She was just utterly fixated uh, by uh, my every move, even when we were separated. Uh, and at the time, I had a, an airplane, and I flew all over the country. Uh, and, you know, she would then would would know where, where my whereabouts was because tail numbers uh, are public information. However, uh, when you have a problem with somebody, as I did with my ex, uh, all you have to do is file a petition with the FAA 
to have your tail number uh, put on a no track list. I did, and my tail number was invisible to everyone. That's all Elon Musk has to do as well. Uh, as I understand it, the journalists who were had their accounts suspended had their accounts suspended, New York Times and uh, I think maybe Washington Post, uh, perhaps CNN. They had their uh, accounts suspended because they were either promoting or somehow um, uh, making uh, more uh, known either the sources of information uh, that made his whereabouts uh, public or the, uh, the source who was doing that uh, very thing. And so he says, you know, I'm not going to treat a journalist any differently than I would treat a person. Uh, they're making me and putting me and my family at risk. You're not welcome here. Uh, and, you know, I, um, I didn't spend $43 billion, but um, I have funded this program uh, for many years. And I also uh, fund all of our Internet uh, uh, sites and our social media outreach. I think, by the way, we're... Yeah. We're uh, um, marketing uh, uh, in Israel again uh, today, so those uh, uh, Yehudim and Yisraelites, welcome to uh, Yada Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh is God's one and only name, easily known, easily pronounced, and exceedingly important. But on these sites where I present uh, the Yada Yahweh series, uh, where we present the podcasts of this program, where we present our archives of other programs. This entire mission is, is devoted to making Yahweh better known, particularly among his people, to encourage uh, Israelis and Yehudim, Jews, uh, throughout the world to uh, forego religion and politics and choose instead to form a relationship with Yahweh. So if someone wants to come on our sites and to discredit either me or these programs, you're not welcome. Now, if you want to pay for your own uh, site, you want to, on your own initiative, go off and uh, trash me. I, personally, I, I think that's a really bad idea uh, since all I do is, is translate and comment on Yahweh's testimony uh, so that it would not be in your interest to do so. But if that is what makes your day, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, but you're not going to do it on the sites that I pay for. Uh, so the uh, the same thing would be true with Elon Musk. He, $43 billion, he's uh, entitled to uh, say, you're not welcome here, uh, even as he claims to be a, an advocate for free speech. Anything else in the news uh, you all want to talk about before we return to uh, HOSHA? We passed on. Another billion dollars of uh, money to, for the military uh, this week, plus Ukraine some more and Taiwan some more. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, in fact, speaking it, of uh, the Ukraine, that I think is just amazing. The United States committed to sending to the Ukraine the one thing that we actually have too few of and too little of, and that is certain to change the nature of that war, the Patriot Missile Defense System. Uh, in Israel, it's called the Iron Dome. For us to send the Ukraine patriots, first of all, Americans are have, will have to operate them, which puts us in the, uh, uh, in the midst of this. And I think we're also committed to sending them uh, F-35s, which, again, Americans will have to operate. Uh, but if the Russians can't fly, uh, they can't send uh, bombs or they can't send missiles, uh, because of the Patriot systems, then they aren't going to retreat. They're not going to go back home with their tails between their legs. They're going to choose a way that they can proceed without putting their own troops at risk. Yes. And if you're smart at all, you know what option we will leave them with when we continue to do as we have done. Yeah. So that's something to think about uh, from a... Um, a Ukraine point of view. It is also interesting that uh, in further news, uh, the Iranian soccer player who led the protest against uh, Iran uh, in support of the uh, uprising against the Ayatollahs there in Iran uh, 
is uh, facing the uh, the death penalty over uh, what he did on behalf of uh, of freedom. You know, yeah. I haven't talked a lot about what's going on in Iran. Uh, I am uh, I'm proud of uh, what these young people are doing, standing up against the religious uh, tyrants. Uh, I would love to see the Ayatollahs uh, strung up by their beards. Uh, they are miserable and deadly human beings. It would be a yeah. much better world if Hezbollah was no longer funded, if Hamas was no longer funded, if Hamas and Hezbollah were no longer equipped with missiles and drones to uh, attack and kill Jews. Uh, it would be a better world if the uh, Iranian uh, Republic uh, guards did not exist. It would be a better world if Nasrallah were not part of it. It would be a better world if Iran was not making a nuclear bomb. And so to the degree that these young people can overthrow this despicable government, the worst government in the world, probably worse than even that in North Korea, so much the better. Uh, my concern, and the reason I haven't spoken much of it, is that they have nothing to turn to. Uh, the secular government uh, is, uh, is long past. It has been a very long time. Uh, since the uh, the Shah was deposed, and that government was not democratic. Uh, and so they have no experience with uh, democracy. Um, the parliamentary system is what all of these uh, countries pick, and it is uh, it is exceedingly broken, as Israel is finding out. Uh, and they have no institutions. I mean, there are there is nothing to turn to. They there is no infrastructure in Iran, no groups, no anything that could they could rally around politically to disgorge themselves of Islamic rule. So I'm um, I'm not optimistic for them, even though I applaud them on what they're attempting to do. Before we return to Hosha. Um, I feel like I need to update you on what has happened with the Babylonian effect. Um, I've now through about 300 pages of volume two of what will now be a series called Babel. We are moving the book of uh, on Daniel, which was called Babel Confusion, uh, such that it is no longer yada yada volume nine but will instead be the Babel series, Volume 1. And Volume 2 of the Babel series will be the book that is currently being written, probably halfway through now, uh, on Ezekiel. And so these two books are going to be pulled out of the Yada Yawa, uh series, and they'll be part still of, of Yada Yawa, as, for example, Questioning Paul is part of Yada Yawa. They're going to be put on the bookshelf after um, coming home and before questioning Paul. Uh, it's where they belong. Uh, and we did have uh, a discussion amongst the uh, those who have read all of the material thus far um, in Ezekiel to make that determination. It was actually uh, at uh, Jackie's behest. Uh, she thought it belonged in a different place. Uh, and so if you want a collector's item, a, uh, a, 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 a quick uh, one and done, you could buy the, uh, the Confusion uh, Babel Volume uh, 9 of Yada Yawa because it's about to become uh, a part of its own series, Babel Volume 1, uh, Chaya Beast. Uh, Toba uh, Abomination is going to be volume two. That's the one on Ezekiel. What prompted this is the 16th chapter of uh, Ezekiel. Um, I think apart from three or four people, um, no one has, has read it, maybe five or six that I've shared it with thus far. Uh, D has uh, is probably the only one that has read the entire chapter as it was just finished. Um, although uh, 
uh, it's been given to five or six different people. It is easily the most reprehensible thing I've ever read. Undoubtedly. Um, yeah, undoubtedly. It, it is uh, um, this uh, chapter I had to preface by, by saying um, that uh, you need to be warned. Um, Satan, uh, who is posing as the Lord, pretending to be Yahweh, uh, goes on the attack, and it's a single a victim that he is attacking, Jewish women particularly Israeli women. And he claims that he has uh, taken Israel as a child, stripped her naked, and raped her. And he uh, goes on and on about uh, his uh, sexual exploits uh, with uh, this adolescent Israel. And then how he dressed her up as a whore but when she didn't prostitute herself as he saw fit, he decided to condemn her. And his condemnation of her is, is, uh, is also breathtakingly ruthless and despicable. He yeah. claims that this, this child whore that he abused, uh, such that she actually bore his children, he claims that she sacrificed her children, butchering them so they could be eaten. And then she says, you are so ugly now. He's speaking of Israelite women. You are so ugly, you can't make a living as a prostitute. You have to bribe men to have sex with you. Talk about demeaning. Then he has the men who are now the prostitutes because they're being paid for sex. He has the men who have made love to these women kill them. And the way that he kills them, the, he, Satan, uh, who is the lord of Babylon, has his men, goons, kill them, is all of those who were paid to have sex with Israel women, Israeli women, gang up, they stone them to death. Then they unbury them and they slice them into little pieces. And then they burn their homes down with their families inside. And then they judge and condemn them. It is a, it's the most despicable thing I've ever read. And to think that, that three religions view this as divinely inspired. I remain um, positive in my accounting of this, because Yahweh had his name associated with this, besmirched by it, by Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, for 2,500 years. As despicable as it is, as, as hard as it is perhaps for the audience of this program to hear this, to tell you that's what is in the 16th chapter of Ezekiel. Can you imagine how reprehensible it is for Yahweh to have his people, Christians also, and Muslims, in addition to religious Jews, throw Ezekiel in his face. Uh, and so it's, it is a, there's a sense of, of compassion that goes with um, exposing and condemning how despicable the book of Ezekiel is. Um, and there are three benefits in doing it, which is why I'm proceeding uh, with it. The first is we have the opportunity to clear Yahweh's good name. He never should have been associated with this trash. Second, if you're going to care for people, Israeli women, for example, you need to expose and condemn those influences that are demeaning them, that preclude them from having any rights. I mean, the, the Lord of Babel actually says that in the midst of this, as he's abusing Jewish women, that one thing that they'll know for certain by his actions is they'll never be able to open their mouths again. They will never be able to speak again. 
so by exposing and condemning this and huge amounts of of Kabbalah and uh, the Zohar came from Ezekiel, and there is enormous amount of Ezekiel's message and uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, Judaism. By exposing and condemning Ezekiel, we help liberate Jewish women. And that is worth doing. And the third thing is, by exposing and condemning a book that uh, Judaism... Christianity and Islam claim to be uh, inspired by their God. We expose and condemn those religions to encourage people to walk away from them. So I think what we're doing is an exceedingly good thing. It's just that how is it that in 2,500 years no one's done this? Yeah. Now, there are people who have said there's conflicts between the Torah and Ezekiel. Well, there are. They're, they're huge. Yeah. Uh, there's people who have uh, said that the the language that Ezekiel is written in uh, suggests that it uh, it was written at a different time. Yeah. But it's not just the language. <laughs> it's it's a word salad. It's Ezekiel is written more poorly than Paul wrote his letters. Yes. And so it is It is astonishing that no one has done what we are doing, uh, systematically going chapter by chapter, word by word, and saying, this is what Ezekiel wrote, and this is why it's not true. And at the end of the fifth chapter, I actually went back to Yahshua 14. Yahshua 14 is where Yahweh expires, uh, inspires what I think is the greatest of the prophets, uh, Isaiah, uh, to expose the uh, the motivations of Satan and how Satan would rise up within Babylon to present himself as he as if he were above the Most High God. And when you read what Isaiah wrote. And you compare it to what is written in Ezekiel, particularly the 16th chapter, but really uh, throughout the first 16 chapters. It's a perfect match. Ezekiel is prophetic in a way. Exactly how Satan operates. Why the three religions that uh, ascribe to Ezekiel all demean women. Um, it's all there for the world yeah. to see. Mm-hmm. And so I think what we're doing is a, is a good thing. One of these days we will dive into uh, Ezekiel. It will be an adults-only uh, program because it is, yeah. it's not just there. As a matter of fact, I, I've been keeping track. Um, there, I'm in the 16th chapter now, just concluded it, and the Lord of Babel, has come up with 18 different ways that he is going to obliterate Jews. So if that's your God, you. you're in serious trouble. Uh, Dee, you um, you had a chance to read it. What were you, is that a fair summary of the 16th chapter? Oh, it's mild and very fair. Uh, generous even. It's worse than words really allow. And I was... Um, slightly traumatized uh, while reading it. I definitely mm-hmm. cried for Israel. Yeah, the hard part of reading it, too, is, um, and um, I need to apologize for, for this as well. Um, I know what it's like to be abused. Uh, my father uh, uh, abused me. He abused my brother. He abused my mother. Uh, so I know something about of, of abuse uh, but I'm still a man and we as men have more options when we're abused um, I very quickly early in my life divorced myself of my father and and overcoming that abuse turned out to be one of the most important stepping stones in my life I developed grit 
I developed uh, right. a sense of, of moral justice as to what I would never tolerate. And so it turned out to be a positive thing for me. That's not always true with women. That's why when men abuse women, as they do in Judaism, in Christianity, and in Islam, uh, it, it is something that as a man, we must expose and condemn. Your treatment of women tells an enormous about, amount uh, about someone. Men are physically stronger than our women. That's just a nature of the way we are built. It is true uh, in most uh, species as well. And so it is our responsibility to stand up for those who cannot protect themselves uh, as completely as and thoroughly as we can. So I'm proud that I'm standing up for women and exposing and condemning uh, Ezekiel, but I have never been an abused woman, obviously. <laughs> and so... For what I'm apologizing for is I only know uh, one style when dealing with um, hellacious material. I'm mm -hmm. sarcastic. That is the only style I know. Uh, if you read uh, anything that is spoken by Elia, uh, known as uh, Elijah, you will uh, you will understand my approach. I poke for it. Um, it's. It's the only way I can get through the material. Um, fortunately, it works for Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh's favorite prophet is Elia. Elia is the most sarcastic of the prophets. Yahweh likes sarcasm. Sarcasm really is intellectual humor. <laughs> However, it is not popular today, and most people condemn sarcasm. Uh, but it's what Yahweh prefers, and it's what I know. And since there's nobody else seeming uh, to be willing to do this, I'm going to do it the way that I know how. I'm going to help readers get through it by being sarcastic. I like now, what you've done with it as however, a reader. However, the, the difficulty is that if a woman's been abused and you're reading this, it's going to be a very, very emotional experience because yes. this is not just a masculine voice. Uh, exploiting as a pedophile and rapist uh, and psychopath uh, women. Uh, this voice has been ascribed to God. This is the Lord pretending to be God, and it provides justification for the bad behavior of many men. And I'm sure for any woman who has experienced abuse, it's, uh, it will be a very emotional read. And uh, for that, I'm sorry. Uh, but also for that, I hope you can appreciate why I'm, I take such a harsh line. Uh, yes. I, I, I don't give Satan a, even an inch. Every single <laughs> mistake he makes, I point it out. And I, and I take no apology. Yes. I said, you know, I may be wearing you down by the fact that I'm pointing out every single mistake that he makes. But, you know, after 2,500 years, it's needed. It is. And think about it from Yahweh's perspective. He's had this garbage thrown in his face for 25 centuries. He deserves to be exonerated. So, Absolutely. That's, yeah. So I can even tell in your voice that uh, it's an emotional experience to uh, read this. But that's the reason why Jackie yeah. uh, correctly decided that this uh, book uh, needs to go uh, after uh, coming home and before uh, questioning Paul. Uh, it is not with, it does not belong with the rest of the series. I agree. All right. So we're going to return back to uh, Hosha uh, for uh, Yisraelites. Um, Yisrael uh, has two uh, potential meanings, very different from uh, one another. Both uh, can be true at times. And since we're uh, broadcasting uh, um, and out, our outreach, I should say, is in Israel tonight, uh, which is our target audience. Uh, Jews worldwide is uh, whom we work for. Uh, we serve Yahweh to reach out to uh, his people. Um, the Yisrael uh, means it's from Ish, which is individual, Sarah, uh, 
which is the mother of the covenant, probably the most extraordinary, not probably, Sarah is easily the most extraordinary woman in God's story. She's one of my very, very favorite people. She also has a sense of uh, sarcasm. Uh, she's just remarkable. Uh, but it's Sarah and, and then L. And Sarah has, uh, there, there are two very different aspects of Sarah in Hebrew. Uh, Sarah can mean to wrestle, struggle, and contend with, in which case it would be individuals who wrestle, contend, and struggle with God. That would be most Israelites most of the time. The second meaning uh, is to endure with, to engage with, and to be liberated by. So it's also individuals who are liberated by God, engage with him, and are empowered by him. So it is a, a name where it's really important for you to know what side of that equation are you on? And so the book of Hosha was written by a Israelite on behalf of Yahweh's people. Tell them that God had, uh, had given up on them, not for all time, but for a very long time. Their propensity to be religious was the issue. So if you, well, if you are ultra-Orthodox, you're not listening to this program because uh, your uh, controllers uh, do not want you to have access to anything that will expose them as the frauds that they are. So they would preclude you from listening to this program. So if you're listening to this program, you are not Herodim. You are not uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish. Uh, you could be listening to this program as an agnostic Jew. You are probably not listening as a progressive Jew because in progressive politics, you're less tolerant than a religious person. It defines your whole life. And so a progressive person is as unlikely to process evidence and reason as a highly religious person. Uh, the same thing would be true, though, with the ultra-right-wing uh, conspiratorial political uh, uh, aspect of Israel. And they're, uh, obviously the right in Israel is, uh, is the empowered uh, position at this point. Um, I actually like the right in the sense of of smaller government is better government because no government is the best government. Uh, so I'm, I would favor uh, a conservative use of power uh, uh, over a liberal use of power. But even there, you have a huge percentage of, of right-wingers, as they would label themselves, who are into all manner of conspiracies and that isn't healthy either, is written to Israelites who are still open to the truth, who are still open to knowing Yahweh, uh, knowing his name, using his name, accepting him as he is, rejecting the religious portrayals of him, trusting and relying on him rather than your favorite politician. And so in this book, Yahweh explains the reasons he is divorcing himself of Israel. He's going to have a very, very long time out, an intermission in the relationship. The chosen people are going to be estranged. He's not substituting them for any other. There's just going to be a very long silence. He has promised at the end of this silence and of this time out to reconcile his relationship with those in Israel, those Yehudim, Jews, who return to him, who acknowledge his name, who accept the terms and conditions of his covenant, who uh, uh, appreciate the purpose of the Moed Mikre, and in particular, Kippurim, which is the second chance for the chosen people. And so this whole book is written about your religious and political propensity 
has caused me to separate myself from you. I, I can't stomach you anymore. Uh, but I am going to reconcile my relationship, but it's going to be a long time in coming. The separation was uh, almost 2,800 um, years ago, um, around 750-ish BCE. And the reunion is not until year 6,000 Ya, which is 33 CE. Your 6,000 Yahs, 33 CE, Mamamides was dead wrong on his dating system. We are um, in 2022, 20, uh, nearing 2023. We're just uh, 10 to 11 years away from Yahweh's return with the Son of God and the Messiah. The Son of God and Messiah is Dode David. And that is approaching quickly, and that is when the reconciliation is going to take place. So that is what this book is about. And God will go at great lengths to explain what Israel did that uh, he found disgusting. And he has focused this at this point on the things that took place in Samaria and the things that took place in the Jezreel Valley, which was the worst of the Israeli experience. In fact, um, uh, Dee, you probably remember as I, uh, um, as uh, we reached towards the end of the 16th chapter, um, the Lord of Babel says he's going to restore the fortunes, the, the lives and the possessions of Sodom and Samaria, uh, which is, uh, is grotesquely immoral, of course, uh, impossible as well, but grotesquely immoral. And he's going to restore uh, Sodom and Samaria so that they can mock and ridicule Israeli women. And I guess if you're Satan, what better place to restore? That would be Samaria and Sodom are your kind of place. And so he's going to restore them. He the bill. Yep, so that uh, they can mock Israeli uh, women. We were at uh, Hosha 2.20 when we uh, concluded the program last week, and it begins, and I will betroth you to me. So this is Yahweh saying, yes, I'm divorcing you because you were religious, because you were overtly political, uh, but a time is coming when we will be remarried. I will betroth you to me forever. I will become engaged for you to approach me in an honest, correct, rightful, and upright manner. Through the exercise of good judgment, by making the most informed and rational decision regarding the means to resolve disputes, and with unfailing kindness, genuine mercy, unrelenting favor, and loyal love, in addition to compassion. The a very specific way that Yahweh did this. And that is that he fulfilled in year 4,000 Yah the first four Moed Mekre, Pesach, Matzah, Lakotim, and Shabuah. And each of those makes it possible for Yisraelites to become part of his families, to become right with God, to be correct, to exercise good judgments and resolve the disputes that exist between God's people and himself. Through Pesach, we mortals become immortal. Through Matzah, the fungus of religion and politics is expunged from us. So we are perfected. On Bukhurim, we are adopted, becoming Yahweh's sons and daughters. On Shabuah, Yahweh empowers us and enriches our lives. These four Moed Mikra were fulfilled in year 4000 Yah, which makes it possible for Yisraelites to be remarried with Yahweh, to engage in a manner that they can approach God, to be honest, correct, and approach him in a rightful and upright manner. It is these things that they should be exercising good judgment regarding. And... This also flows right into the next 
3 Moed Mikre. You are listening to the fulfillment of Teruah. That is, our mission is to use what mm-hmm. God has provided through his prophets and to share it with you. And Teruah is both about issuing a warning that the religious and political path lead away from God and also to uh, provide a witness to what Yahweh has actually said so you know how to approach him. This leads then to Kippurim. Kippurim is exclusively for Israelites. It is a time of reconciliation. It's the wayward child coming back home, being reconciled in the relationship. And this leads five days later to Sukkah, which is where we all, as covenant children, get to camp out with our Heavenly Father forevermore. Then I will betroth you to me, engaging so that you can approach me in a steadfast and trustworthy manner, and you shall yada Yahweh, know and acknowledge Yahweh. God never mentioned that he wants you to believe him. He has no interest in you believing him. No interest whatsoever in faith. Hates religion. Doesn't want you to worship him. Doesn't want you to even pray to him. No interest in those things. He wants you to use your mind so that you come to know him and thereby trust him. He wants you to yada Yahweh. Know him. Acknowledge him. Become familiar with him. Respect him. Understand Yahweh. And he has given us all that we need to, to know to be able to do that through the Torah, prophets, and Psalms. For those of you who have been told, but, but you know, I'm told by the rabbi, we, uh, we can't understand them. We need uh, them to explain it to us. Well, if that was true, then why didn't Yahweh say so? He never mentions rabbis. No office of rabbi. He actually says, I'm communicating to you in such a way you all should be able to understand it. But if you're a little concerned, and obviously if you're listening to this program, you understand English. It is the lingua franca of the world. It is the language actually spoken by more Jews than any other. If you're listening to this program and you want to know Yahweh's name, you want to be assured that he exists, you want to know what books he inspired and which ones he did not, And if you want to know what he said, specifically, what is Yahweh offering and what does he expect in return? Then I would encourage you not only to listen to this program, but go to yadayah.com. Yada means to know. Yahweh is, or Yah or Yahweh, the name, one and only name of God. Yadayah.com. Some 25 books presented there in their entirety, every one of them free, encouraging you to read and learn more about yourselves and the God who created you in the universe. And if you would prefer a paperback or hardback uh, book, uh, all of these books are available for the cost of printing and shipping with no royalty to us at uh, Amazon.com. You can either uh, search by uh, Yada Yahweh series, Yahowa, that's how God's name is pronounced, Yahowa, uh, or by my name, Craig Wynn, and it will take you to all of them. The Kindle versions are so cheap, uh, I'm, I don't think you could buy a pack of bubblegum for uh, what the uh, Amazon charges. Take advantage of this. It's there for you to learn. We, God wants you to know him. We want you to know him. Within the breath covenant, Yahweh is our heavenly father, and the Ruach Kodesh is our spiritual mother. Symbolically, however, Yisrael is also presented as God's beloved, his bride. The nation which was divorced for religious infidelity 
will be reconciled on Kippurim and Aras betrothed under the chupa of Sukkah. After a long intermission, Yahweh's family will be reunited again. Now, it's really interesting. I, I had a, a conversation last week on uh, marriage and relationships within uh, Yahweh's uh, covenant family as prescribed in his Torah. And I'm sure I said some things that were surprising to people, yeah. but yeah, nonetheless, it's, yeah. Uh, it is Yahweh's approach. And, and we're talking about marriage here. There are no marriage vows in the Torah. There's no ring ceremony. There's no religious uh, uh, person officiating. There's no promises to death do us part. There's no promises of monogamy. There are uh, there is no commitment other than don't engage in really perverted sex. You can't have sex with your children or with your parents or uh, with uh, uh, sheepies and lammies. Uh, you can't uh, have sex with uh, with um, uh, under the uh, the situation of rape. Do not take advantage of somebody uh, that you have uh, some influence or power over. Don't do that kind of stuff. But otherwise, whatever you do, it's fine with me. He doesn't have any rules against promiscuity or premarital sex as the religious uh, are want to condemn. Nothing. He says, you know, if you want to have more than one wife, that, that's okay, too. Doesn't recommend it, but he says, that's fine. Just make certain that you can provide everything that each one of them needs. Don't have a second if you yeah. can't take care of the first. God is not actually a proponent of monogamy. The person he loved most had eight wives and ten concubines. So God's not uh, trying to limit us in this regard. And as it relates to marriage, there is no service. There are no vows. Uh, it's simply you come together to be married and to have children and raise a family and live together in a home uh, and establish a relationship together then by all means refer to yourself as husband and wife. But it's interesting, there actually is no word in Hebrew for husband and wife. The two words that are most often used to convey husband and wife are simply uh, ish, male individual, and isha, female individual. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm married to my wife, uh, Leah, but in Hebrew, she is my woman. And in Hebrew, I am her man. And it's not because of a, uh, a ceremony. It's the way we act together. And Yahweh yeah. also said, if you don't want to be married, if you're not happy together, then all you need to do is express your concerns in a letter. Explain to the other person why you don't want to be married anymore, and then go on your way. There's a few instructions on on uh, on what you can do with uh, other in-laws and outlaws and that sort of uh, of thing. But you know, God's view on this is not complicated, and it's not restrictive in the way that religions are. So I'm sharing all this with our listeners because Yahweh says He's going to betroth Himself to Israel. If there are to be terms and conditions, vows, if you will, in marriage, then they're found in the Bereth Covenant. That's where you'll find them. There are five conditions and five benefits in the covenant. The first condition, if you want to be married to God, walk away from religion and politics. Walk away from Babel, which is where... Abraham and Sarah came. Walk away. Disassociate from religion and politics. First condition of the covenant. 
Second is to walk to Yahweh and become perfected. You do that by celebrating Pesach and Matzah. And as a religious Jew, you would never celebrate matzah uh, because even though from Yahweh's perspective, Pesach falls under matzah, religious Jews have inverted that and made matzah part of Pesach. Uh, the difference is night and day, life and death, perfection and remaining corrupt, estranged from God. Uh, so God says, walk to me and become perfected. You do that by correctly observing Pesach and Matzah. Chag Matzah, as he would call it. Uh, the third condition is to trust and rely on Yahweh. Well, that's the alternative to trusting and relying on religion or politics, to somehow save your soul or save your body or save your wealth or whatever it may be. Uh, we citizens of the world have a tendency to rely on our political party, our, our nation, uh, our military, <coughs> giving them credit for our freedoms uh, or uh, our religion for saving uh, souls. And God says, no, no, no. If you want to be married to me, then uh, you will trust and rely on me. And isn't that what we would do in a healthy marriage? Mm -hmm. Trust yes. and rely on each other? I trust my wife. I rely on her. I do. I rely on her for a lot of things. And I trust her. <laughs> I trust her explicitly. In fact, I have never had a moment where I didn't trust her. And you know, even in perfection, in the previous condition, we both make each other better. Perfection is a process. You're better than you, you were. I have fewer flaws. My flaws are less evident because of our relationship. My life is, each day is better. Uh, the next uh, condition of the, uh, the covenant, uh, the fourth, is to closely examine and carefully consider the terms and conditions of this relationship, which is what we're doing right now, which is something that my wife and I do regularly. We talk about what are the terms and conditions that uh, Yahweh is offering, and how can we apply those to our lives? The, uh, the fifth is that uh, as a man, you are to be circumcised, and as a parent, it's your responsibility to circumcise your sons so that you and they remember the covenant. It's part of that sign, and it's certainly part of the uh, anatomy that is an important aspect of a um, of a loving marriage. So those are really the vows of a marriage. They're presented as part of the Bereth Covenant, which is really a father, our Heavenly Father and Mother, their spiritual mother, the Ruach Kadesh, coming together to raise children, which would be the children of the covenant. Now, Recognizing that this exchange of vows is occurring on sukkah shelters, it's hard to miss the wedding chupa, the canopy covering, which is shimmering at, uh, at sunrise and fluttering in the dawn's breeze. A sukkah is a covering in the form of a shelter, a tent, or booth. And thus, we're talking about the marriage canopy. Yahweh has written his vows for his bride his devotion is forever. He has promised to engage in such a way that Israel is drawn to him. His approach is honorable. The result is vindicating. And during this engagement, both God and his bride will be upright and truthful. And while that's nothing new for Yaha, it's going to be a different approach for Israel. As always, Yahweh wants his beloved to uh, use their best judgment to make an informed and rational decision regarding their relationship. But this is a marriage of mind and heart, sound thinking, and unfailing love. It is one of the things that we find that is very different in Ezekiel, for example, than in Yahweh's point of view. 
from Ezekiel's point of view, uh, there is oh, yeah. no choice. Yeah, no free will. It uh, uh, you are compelled uh, to act, and so one of his uh, most lethal attacks is against freedom and choice. The moment you eliminate freedom, you've eliminated love. You've eliminated the covenant. It has to be an act of love, an act of choice. Compassionate as always, Yahweh promises to be kind, indeed generous, affectionate, and merciful towards his returning bride. She has been through hell. And if anyone was ready, she is now ready for heaven. It is among the most alluring messages, I think, in the prophets. The long-term intermission will soon be over. God is engaging with his people again acknowledging that they can approach him in a steadfast and trustworthy manner and then remain together forevermore. Of these receptive souls, Yahweh says, and you will yada, Yahweh. Having invested now 21 years translating God's words to compose yada, Yahweh, it is, of course, reassuring to see the title that has been chosen for these books be used by Yahweh long, long ago, literally scribed within this prophecy foretelling the reconciliation of Yisrael with Yahweh. This has been our mission, and Yahweh has defined it. I am exceedingly pleased that we have done this. And... Um, I think most of the listeners know that you know there, there's a family behind what you see when you go to the Yada Ya site. Uh, it, there's a family that has contributed to it. If you participate in uh, social media, there's it's a family commitment uh, even uh, there. Uh, it was uh, my wife that uh, was responsible for this uh, integrated look at uh, Yada Yawa. Um, she actually said uh, about four years ago, uh, right after we met for the first time, um, we had been pen pals. I had known her because, well, she wrote me, uh, I guess the first email might have been some 12 years ago. <laughs> she wrote me an, uh, an scolding letter saying, you know, damn it, but uh, w what you've written is true. Uh, you know, she said, I've spent a month, I uh, hardly slept reading each of the books over and over again. Now you could take three months <laughs> and never read any page twice. Uh, there's so much of them. But she says, uh, what you've written is true, but why you? This is, uh, you're, you've admitted that you're a goy, and these books are uh, ours. They're to our people and our language. What in the world are you doing? Uh, you know, of course, I wrote her back and said, yeah, you're absolutely right. It shouldn't be uh, It shouldn't be me, but because there were none of your people that were willing to do it, you gave not, yeah, well, no other choice. So uh, I was chosen out of default. Now, where do we go from here? And that's really, uh, it's it's really true. Um, but she is the one that, uh, that said, after all of that, and now, you know, you've got all these years that we've exchanged uh, letters where she said, you know, she would tell me where I was right about something I said on this program or wrote in one of the books or wrong, or where uh, uh, she said, you know, you're, you're partially right, but there's 87,500 more details that you've missed along the way. Uh, and <laughs> she then uh, told me that, uh, you know, um, I wouldn't give one of, uh, of your books um, uh, to a, uh, my brethren, uh, to Jews. And she explained why she was uncomfortable doing so. Now, the fact is my wife's a tremendous in introvert, and she's not going to do it anyway. But <laughs> nonetheless, she says, I, I wouldn't. There's, uh, there's, you know, you, I, I understand, you know, you've, you've uh, exposed and condemned uh, Paul. Good thing. You've exposed and condemned Mohammed and Prophet of Doom, Paul and questioning Paul. But when you read these books, they're the foe, uh, the villain that you're you're attacking is most always Christianity, and so 
uh, how would you claim that the target is Jews if you're attacking Christianity? So, well, you know, the, the reason for that, I, I was once a Christian. I understand that religion. When Yahweh says something that's contradictory towards Christianity, I know it. You know, I was an ordained ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church. I, uh, I was a trained evangelist. I, I led Bible studies. I know Christianity. I had left it prior to Yahweh reaching out and asking me to uh, engage in this mission. So I knew it. I could speak intelligently about it. It's kind of like Yahweh asking Moshe to go with him into Egypt. He knew the beast. He knew the politics. He knew the religion. He didn't like them. He left them. And so Yahweh didn't have to explain to him what was awful about Egypt. He knew it already. Same thing with me, with the world's most popular religion. I knew it. I left it. I was disgusted by it. Judaism is a complicated beast. And it's part of the problem is that it's migrated all over Hell's Half Acre. The most... Um, popular form of Judaism worldwide, not in the United States as much, although it's popular in the United States, but certainly in Israel, is the ultra-Orthodox variety, our uh, Hasidic Judaism. Well, it was conceived in the uh, 1800s. Uh, it, it was uh, projected back on a, a man who, I don't know if he was illiterate or he just didn't write anything, but uh, he's known as Baal Shem Tov, the Lord of the Good Name. And it's kind of backwards projected on him where he's made into an almost godlike figure. But that's where the re religion uh, began. And so, I mean, to follow rabbinic Judaism is just to go everywhere. I mean, they all claim, beginning with the lie, that... Their Talmud is the oral law that was given to Moshe and the seven, uh, 70 elders at the same time of the Torah, even though the Torah says exactly the opposite, and there isn't any evidence of any of this until the uh, first and second centuries CE. Uh, so it's an impossible it's position. But, but impossible positions never, ever bothered yeah. the religious. Um, that's why they call it faith and belief, because it's untrue. So Judaism is a tough beast because it just, first of all, the, the rabbis are far more clever than are the other religious authors. Their lies um, are all uh, very effective counterfeits. They, they take something that's in the Torah prophets and deliberately miscast it and twist it as Satan did when he tricked Chawa in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and so it's verbose. There are, you know, you want, if you were to say, okay, this is the view of that Judaism has of salvation, well, you can't find it. You know, the, the bottom line is there is no view of salvation. Uh, it, just as they deny Sheol hell. But you'll find a thousand different approaches to trying to obfuscate the reality that there is no salvation in Judaism. Right. So it's a very complicated religion to expose and condemn because it is literally all over the place. You, you could read a million variations of the, uh, of the religion. That's not an exaggeration. But well, she says, you know, you really need to rewrite these books and uh, and be serious about the fact that Yahweh called you uh, on Teruah to speak to his people. And so I did. And in so doing, she's the one that says, and when you do this, we're going to have a common theme. Right now, your books are all over the place. They all have a different look and feel. We're going to have a common theme. And uh, and she came up with a print style and a coloration and a look that now you'll see across the board in all of the volumes. If you go to yadayawa.com or yadayaw.com, you'll, you'll see the result of that. Now, uh, she came up with the idea, and there was a lot of refinements along the way. And we have uh, fact checkers and editors and contributors, and uh, Jackie, our, our publisher, uh, have devoted countless hours to making 
this a reality, and I spent three years of my life rewriting every book. And I've rewritten every book, retranslated everything that I had previously translated expressly, such that every word would be directed toward Jehudim. Yahweh wants your attention. Yahweh wants Yisrael to return home, and we have rewritten everything under Yada Yahweh to convey that message to you. And now it is consistent, it is forthright, it is steadfast, it is dependable. Uh, and this book on Hosha is such a marvelous example because Hosha was the first book I translated 21 years ago. And it was the last book that I rewrote uh, just a year ago. Um, and you can see how far we have come in terms of our understanding of God's people. And, and now when, when God says something, he's speaking to his people, so he's renouncing Judaism. We take the time to find out what aspect of Judaism is in conflict with that particular subject. So it doesn't mean that Goyim aren't going to find depth of meaning. I, I, Kirk, you're, uh, you're Goy, mm -hmm. as am I. I don't think you have yep. felt in any way left out because we have more adroitly targeted God's people. No. Same, same because message. Same, when you become same part of home. the covenant family as a Goy, you accept Yahweh's preference for his people. Yeah, you cannot be anti-Semitic and be a member of the covenant. So having done this, it, um, it is certainly reassuring to see Yahweh's preference for that title, Yada Yahweh. And if you'll indulge this witness for a moment more, the wah between this introductory thought and its conclusion serves to bring them together, with one leading to the other. For from this perspective, Yahweh may also have intended, then I will betroth you to me, encouraging you so that you can approach me in a trustworthy and reliable manner, one verified, confirmed, and upheld by Yada Yahweh. Then I will betroth you to me, engaging so that you can approach me in a trustworthy and reliable manner, one verified, confirmed, and upheld by Yada Yahweh. And even if that is one stride too far, for many Israelites, the bride will have been brought back to the wedding chupa in time for sukkah. And... For many, it will be by this presentation of Yahweh's vows. Now, because of Teruah, yeah, and if you are a Jew listening to this program, you probably say, Teruah, what in the heck are you talking about? And that is because Jews have replaced Teruah with Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the first of the year in the old Babylonian religious uh, calendar. Uh, Yahweh does not want you celebrating Rosh Hashanah. It is teruah, uh, which means to blow the shofar so that you are alerting God's people of impending doom, the impending doom of religion and politics, while sharing that there is a proper path to God that leads to your salvation. Because of teruah, Yisrael will find Kippurim. And Israelites will do so in time to celebrate Sukkah. We know this because Yermayah wrote specifically of it. That is the purpose of Yermayah 31, is that, that Yisrael and Yahuda will be reunited again as they were under God's beloved son, Dod. And that collectively, Yahweh will reaffirm the covenant with Yisrael and Yahuda being reconciled together and reconciled unto him. And that there will be a difference this time, God says, and that difference is that he will literally write a copy of his Torah inside of us 
so that we will have an absolute perfect access to what God is instructing. And you can be assured there will not be a single letter from the Talmud as part of that inscription, nor the Christian New Testament, nor the Zohar, and most assuredly, not the Quran. It will be at this time, during this specific day, I will respond, Anah, prophetically declares Yahweh. I will provide the answer, Anah, in association with the spiritual realm of the heavens, and they will reply on the earth. I will answer that which is associated with growing exponentially, as symbolized by grain, becoming an heir by new wine and olive oil representing the spirit of enlightenment. And they shall provide answers regarding Yezreel, what God has sown. So I will sow, planting her seed for myself within the land and upon the earth. I will have compassion for, demonstrate mercy toward, even come to love and forgive, lo rukmaha. No mercy. I will say to Lo Amani, not my people, you are my family. And then he will say, you are my God. Hosha, he delivers. 2.23 was the last statement. The first that I read was 2.21. What a powerful message. There will be a specific day. That specific day is the second chance for the chosen people, Yom Kippurim. That day is based on Ana. Ana is is such a simple word in Hebrew. Its primary meaning is to answer. Secondary meaning would be to reply. When someone gives you an invitation to attend, and mikrab is based upon the verb kara, uh, mikra is the plural of mikra. Uh, mikra is a compound of uh, of my, which is a Hebrew interrogative that says we should contemplate and question the implications of kara. Kara means to invite and summon, to meet and to greet, to read and recite. So if you are given an invitation, particularly from God, What is the most important thing you can do? Respond. Yeah, Anna. And so God throughout his Moed Mikre encourage us to Anna respond. But religious Jews, not wanting any Jew to respond to Yahweh, have changed Anna from respond, from reply, from answer to afflict. And so the day of reconciliation, they have turned into a high holy day where you should be abasing and afflicting your soul. And somehow the expression of that is to abuse chickens and twirl them over your head. (laughs) Talk about stupid. I mean, clearly, folks. Rabbinical Mm -hmm. Judaism is the dumbest of the dumb religions. And that takes some doing because... Scientology and Mormonism and Islam and Christianity are all pretty stupid. But for smart people, Judaism is a dumb, dumb religion. And talk about stupid. Here's the day of reconciliations, and you think God wants you to respond by harming yourself, by denying yourself. What do you think a reconciliation is? It's a party. The family of God, the covenant family of God is being reconciled. The wayward child is coming back home. God is celebrating, and you want to afflict yourself? What the hell is wrong with you? It's Yom Kippurim. The I-Y-M ending means it's plural. Not only are Yisrael and Yahudah being reunited again, as they were under our Messiah, the King of Kings, Dode. 
But in addition to that, Yahweh's people are being reunited with God. It is the ultimate celebration. It's the day that God cares about more than any other. And it will be at this time. During this specific day, prophetically declares Yahweh, I will provide the answer. Will you respond? In association with the spiritual realms of the heavens, and they will reply on the earth. And the earth will answer, Are you going to be part of that voice? That which is associated with growing exponentially, as symbolized by grain. Becoming an heir, symbolized by new wine. And the olive oil representing the spirit of enlightenment. And collectively, they shall provide answers regarding Yisrael, what God has sown, the seed and offspring of God, from Zerah to sow, to conceive, to produce, and yield, and El, God, commonly translated as Jezreel. That's one of the marvelous things about Hebrew. So many horrible things happened to distance Israel and Yahweh in the Jezreel Valley, and yet mm-hmm. Yahweh is going to turn it into a wonderful thing. And they shall provide answers regarding Yisrael, God has sown. And so I will sow, planting her seed for myself within the land and upon the earth. God gets something out of this. When we elect to become part of his covenant family, God grows. His experience is enriched. It makes his existence better. Just as it does when we conceive and raise children as part of our families. Whether that's an adopted child, whether that is a naturally born child, whether that is a spiritual child. We all grow in this way. As does Yahweh. God gets something out of the covenant. Thank goodness he does. Otherwise, what motivation would there have been for him to put up with us all this time? He wants to create a new universe with us participating. Because when you do something wonderful, it's much more enjoyable when it's shared with those you care about and love. And so this is why God is doing it for himself. And I will have compassion for and demonstrate mercy toward, even come to love and forgive. No mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my family. And he will say, you are my God. Please, if you're listening in Yisrael tonight, take these words to heart. Be among the chorus that are saying, you are my God. The timing of this is neither random nor open-ended. There is only one day distinct from all others. It is Yom Kippur, the day of reconciliation. And this is celebrated in year 6,000 Yah. It's when the remnant of the children of Israel will respond to God in this way. That day, so that you know it, is sunset 6.22 p.m. in Jerusalem, October 2nd. 2033. Yahweh will return to Jerusalem and he will bring David, Dod, with him. But please don't wait to the last minute. Too many things can go wrong and too many things can go right between now and then to postpone. Too many things can go wrong because the vast majority of people living on the planet today are not going to live to see year 2033 God's doing of man's doing there are going to, there's going to be a hellacious war we've lit the match of that bomb not only mm-hmm. in what we did 
in our invasion of Iraq, giving Iraq to Iran and setting the Islamic world ablaze, but also with our invasion of uh, the Ukraine with American military weapons and uh, putting the world on um, on a pace uh, where we will soon have nuclear conflagration. So it is, uh, it is going to be very deadly between now and then. And if you don't make it to Yahweh's return and you have not chosen to be with him, then your soul will either cease to exist or if you have been overtly religious or overtly political and tried to lure other people away from Yahweh by your religion and politics, then you will spend eternity, your soul will spend eternity in the place of separation, Sheol. Don't take that risk. Nothing but bad can happen as a result of delay. Also, think of the good that can happen. Join us. Be a voice for Yahweh. It's exciting. Yahweh is liberating. He has so very little of us, and what he asks of us is actually in our benefit. He he is enlightening. He is empowering. He is enriching. He is emancipating. He is fun to be around. Enrich your life. Enlighten your mind. By choosing to be part of the covenant now. There's only wonderful enjoyment. Sure, you'll be ostracized by the religious and political community. But that's a good thing. Because you'll be in great company with Yahweh. He will protect you. You will feel his presence in your life. And with every word that you read from his prophets, you'll be more and more assured that you are in good and capable hands. And that you can trust him and rely upon him. It will transform your life for the better. Do it. And do it now. For the first time since we strolled together in the garden, it's going to be heaven on earth again. What is conveyed in the spiritual realm will be heard on earth. We will all rejoice, growing exponentially, inheriting the kingdom and we will be anointed by the Spirit. What God has sown will finally take root and will produce as He intended. The only memory of Yisrael, Jezreel, will be of the seeds God has sown to make this day possible. This is the beauty of Hosha, because the worst of times leads to the best of times. Those who have long been unlovable, will be loved and forgiven. The children who were disinherited will be reunited. The Israelites will come to know God again. It would be impossible to write a more favorable conclusion to the second chapter of Hosea than God has already done. We've reached the end of our broadcast portion of our program, but in the world of... Uh, mm-hmm. of blogs and of these kinds of programs now 95 percent of the listeners choose to listen on their own time when they see fit and and thus to the archives we are still recording um and uh, so i'm open to anything that you kirk uh, or d would like to uh, contribute mm-hmm. based upon what you have heard this evening no i uh, I, I, I like the Go ahead, D. No, you go ahead, Kirk. I think he's done great. That's all I had to say. <laughs> no, I, I uh, last night and yesterday and last night uh, took it upon. I, I started studying Anna again because it always bothers me that because this is about young Kippurim and um, how so I analyzed everything I could about that. How many times it's been used? How it's used in what conjunction? And the little and I even looked at the letters to say, okay, there is the first letter is a yin. An A, but it's drawn in a pictograph as as a I, and I always translate that letter itself as perspective. And so whose perspective was his man's or God's? Every time you find the uh, afflicted is from man's perspective. Every time you find the respond, testify, even sing or respond in a song and and answer and receive, uh, it's always from God's perspective. 
he's consistent throughout everything that you uh, do. If you look, I mean, I have more fun actually, but I, I have great fun on Friday. But it's also a ton of fun <laughs> mm-hmm. when I'm leading up to that and I'm studying whatever, and I and I'm not doing it by. I don't necessarily go through every word that uh, you've written there. Most of them we've done many, many times, but I, I go on my little tangents of, of that. I even I even spent a half an hour uh, looking up, okay, I said, okay, why do they call him Lord? And how do you, mm-hmm. so I kept on with Lord. And an interesting thing I had not thought about before, I, every time we do, I go through the same thing with, I said, okay, here's Yahweh's name. They call him Lord. And and doesn't matter what the religion, they call him Lord. So I went through that and I said, okay, um, how is it, how do we define Yahweh's name? And it's always defined by a verbal root, which is, in this case, it was uh, uh, when you have Haya. Mm-hmm. What I just, and it's got three of the letters out of the four letters of his name are in there and so forth. And it goes on and on and on. So I went through everything I did with that. Then I said, okay, let's look up Lord. And, of course, everywhere you look, thousands of times or hundreds of times, is Baal. So I looked up Baal, and I looked up every version of Baal. And Baal... It, and, and I said, okay, if that's a Hebrew word, it should be defined by a verbal root. So I looked at mm-hmm. the verbal root. There isn't any. There isn't any. It's a verb. Sometimes it's used as a verb. Sometimes it's used, but 99% of the time it's a noun. So I said, mm-hmm. well, it has no bear. So the upshot of all of that was how do rabbis, because we're picking on them now. Christians are too easy targets. You can shoot them off real quick. The mm-hmm. <laughs> why... How can they justify simple language as little as I know, which is probably a lot more than a lot of folks now, but but as little as I know, I'm not a scholar, I can go through that and I can find, okay, there is no justification to change the name to Lord based no. on anything. It has nothing in conjunction with Yahweh's name, and nothing in association with Yahweh's name. It doesn't fit any form. They just pop it over there and they do it. It, yes. it doesn't conform. There's no verbal root to it. There's nothing. So, how do you do that? And why has no one ever said that's BS? Yeah. Why? Why when it. Yahweh tells us that Satan's most commonly it. used name and title, the name and title that Yahweh Himself uses to introduce the adversary, the ultimate false god, is Baal. Yes. Baal means Lord. Yeah. So why would you take another Hebrew word, uh, which is also the name of the Greek god Adonis, why would you take another Hebrew word, corrupt it to mean Lord, and then replace Yahweh's name 7,000 times with my Lord, when Yahweh says that negating my name is an unforgivable sin? Yeah. Yeah. That's the third statement that he etched in stone. Belittling, negating right. my name, causing it to be for naught, i.e. replacing it 7,000 times with my Lord, is an unforgivable sin. Why would you do that? You know, and Adon is actually based on a Hebrew word that is used throughout the Torah, Edon. Edon mm-hmm. means upright Edom, pillar. Upright pole. It is the upright yeah. pole in the center of the tent of the witness, which makes it more secure mm-hmm. And uh, and makes it uh, able that it can be enlarged. Uh, and so that was the term that was corrupted. It means my upright one uh, or upright pillar. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, the foundation and uh, my basis would be uh, Edoni. Uh, and that was corrupted to Adonai. And it's my Lord. So God is disgusted by that. And the reason God is so disgusted about the idea of the Lord he has presented himself as the father of the covenant. The covenant is a family. You can't no have your master. father be a lord. Nobody worships their father. No one bows down to their father. Fathers uplift their children. Lords suppress. Lords own. Lords control. Fathers do the opposite. So it's just despicable to refer to I'm Yahweh's so Lord. Yeah, I feel a little Maybe haunted so. by Ezekiel tonight. So, I mean, this yeah, is the antithesis I do too. of, yeah. I get it. Yeah. Hosha's like the opposite. 
of Ezekiel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Ezekiel is constantly referring to my Lord and Master, and I have removed Yahweh's name. Um, it's uh, it's constantly uh, my Lord and Master Yahweh is what the author wrote, but Yahweh is not a Lord or Master, and it most certainly is not Yahweh speaking, because it is Satan trying to impersonate Yahweh. So in my translation of it. I use uh, characters to and replace uh, yod he wah he and rather than write uh, Yahweh, uh, which would be the proper transliteration of yod he wah he there are four uh, uh, vowels in Hebrew, I write, this is not him. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, because Yahweh is not a lord, he is not a, a master, and he most right. assuredly, did not inspire these despicable words. I mean, yes, Yahweh refers to his people as adulterers. He says um, both men and women are harlots and whores and prostitutes. But he never speaks of that in terms of sex. It has yeah, nothing so to do with their religion. sexuality. Yeah. yeah, it has all to do with their proclivity to be no. religious and to have affairs with false gods. Hashem, the Lord. Very different yeah. approach. Mm-hmm. Total different condemnation. Yeah. And I'm I, sorry, I was kind of unfair to uh, to Dee. No. Uh, and maybe you as well, Kirk, oh, yeah. to send that chapter out as I did an hour and two before the, the show. Cause unless you're someone like myself where you're just, you've done this so long that uh, you see good in everything. And you can point out that there's actually good in the ultimate bad. And you can't get any worse than Ezekiel 16. But I see it as liberating and exciting because after all these years, we're removing this curse from upon uh, the Jewish people, upon Jewish women, uh, upon uh, those who are afflicted by the religions that swear that this book was inspired by their God. And so for me, it's this, it's this great victory, this great opportunity to help uh, people know the truth. Uh, but... I'm yeah. sure the first time through it, unless you have that same perspective, it's got to be pretty depressing. It's well, pretty heavy. Contrasting it with Hosha, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, <laughs> it's it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm sure that I omitted a lot of uh, of what's there that is uh, it's even um, worse. But it it is it is bad, and it's uh, disorienting too because. It is a word salad. It's it's like you uh, you throw together three sentences where you would say uh, uh, said we're into franchise former uh, league uh, Smith um, model twelve. Yeah, what do you do with it? What do you? What, yeah, and you know what the really sad thing is. Is that, you know, after now uh, 300 pages of uh, analyzing this gobbledygook, I actually understand it and can explain where, where it's wrong. And sometimes I go back and say, you know, this is really unfair that I'm explaining where this is wrong because it, it suggests that I understand gobbledygook. Uh, but, you know, I've been writing about Satan for a long time. That's how Yao and I met. He, oh, yeah. uh, he asked me to expose yeah. uh, Allah. And Allah is uh, modeled directly after Satan. And then he asked me to expose and condemn Paul. Uh, Paul and uh, and Paul, like and the Muhammad, was demon-possessed. Yeah. Yeah. And so it uh, is uh, satanic. Uh, so when I have to do it now for Judaism, uh, that have, uh, and it was the Jew that wrote uh, uh, Ezekiel, let's be clear about that. Uh, and it's a book yeah. that is more incorporated into Judaism than any other religion, although Christians dearly love it. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, you um, it's, it is a real eye opener uh, that uh, that this book is so despicable, and and yet it is incorporated into those religions. And there'll be a lot of people that say, you know, how dare you speak out against Daniel and Ezekiel that are beloved prophets. Oh, how dare I not? Yeah. Yep. It has to be done. Yes, it needs to be done, and we yeah. and the time the time is right to liberate 
both women and God's people and the religious uh, from this horrible curse. But you know what? The one thing that just struck me all the way through is that Mm -hmm. uh, one of two things is true with Satan. Either he really isn't very bright and isn't very capable. He can't get a single prophecy right. He can't get the past right. He's uh, easily confused. He contradicts himself. His uh, ability to write is uh, is worse than a, a third grader uh, with ADD. Uh, so he, you read this and say, okay, either Satan is an incompetent boob, and boy, has he overplayed his hand, or he's doing what I saw him do in Islam and in the Christian New Testament, which is to say to God, these humans that you created are so stupid. So I will tell I them mean, that I am I their God. I will tell them that I have demon-possessed Muhammad and Paul, and they'll lick it up like it's uh, it's sugared syrup hey, water. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what is it to find like these it. people that you love when they're that stupid? Uh, and so that's, <laughs> that's the only other possibility. Is is there is no level of gibberish that I will convey or, or horrible <laughs> things that I will say. I could contradict you all day long and claim to be you, and they're too stupid to figure it out. And this clearly, 99.99999% of people are proving his point, but yeah. God doesn't think so. He disagrees. He says, okay, yeah, I realize that most of them have gone astray, but so long as there's a few, so long as there's a Moshe along the way, so long as there is a Noach, so long as there is a a, a, a Yosha, a Koleb, uh, um, so long as there is a Sarah, so long as, as there is a, a Ruth, a Deborah, so long as there's a Dod, so long as there's a Yashaya and a Yermaya and a Zachariya, um, then I've made the right choice. And a Yada Yada. Yeah. Uh, and, well, and a Yada Yada. Yada Yada Yada. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah, he, yada, yada. Even found, yeah. he even found that with enough support, even a goy can understand it. Now you you got to bring out all the big guns. You have to give him all seven of the spirits working together. But nonetheless, you if need you a little extra help. Support, and you give him enough time. Yeah, even a goy can figure it out. Lay and I were were uh, were talking because uh, uh, Ezekiel has been a very traumatic thing in uh, in our household. Yes, he um, And uh, as I and, and I've. I read uh, what I have written every day uh, to her at the at the end of the uh, the day, and she says, "You know, the only person I know that could uh, do this kind of thing, and and not be so disgusted that you you would uh, walk give away after after the first uh, paragraph. How in the world yeah, are you able to stick with it and continue to uh, to do this? And uh, and you know, I, so I said, well, because it." Um, it's the job. Um, yeah. uh, you know, once upon a time, I had thought that um, that I was working at at my leisure, and that uh, anything that I contributed was was uh, good, but that I had no responsibility. Uh, that mm-hmm. time is long past. I know yeah. now that there is a lot of responsibility, and it goes with the job. I've been given a great deal of uh, of help, and it's it's my responsibility to do what we're uh, what we're doing and i'm not going to let god down um, uh, daniel and ezekiel was my first chance to do something where um, i may have for the first time in my life be giving god more than he's giving me that is such a thrill to think about when you look at what we have uh, accomplished together but um yeah. By doing this, we're no clearing one's God's good name. Now. Yeah. 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 So it is a it's, it mm-hmm. is a very important thing. But you know, I when I was writing uh, these chapters today on Ezekiel, one thing is abundantly clear: unless you know the message that's conveyed in Hosha, you can't 
do what I'm doing mm-hmm. in, in uh, Ezekiel. Mm-hmm. Unless you know the message that was conveyed through Yahshua, unless you were in love with what was uh, shared by Moshe, who's the man I respect the most, or by Dode, the man that Yahweh loves more than any other. So I'm not saying that I don't admire and love uh, Dode. I do. I, it just my um, uh, Dode was much more emotional than I am. Uh, I, I just really identify with the the uh, the character and the courage. Uh, and the dedication and the judgmental style of, uh, of Moshe. He's, I, I, and you, you study these people and you, and what Yahweh had to say about them. And until you've done that, you're not in a position to expose and condemn uh, Daniel or uh, Ezekiel or the Babylonian effect. And you're constantly pulling um, and drawing from what you've learned. Yeah. So been fun to do this program with you. I'm sorry that I, I talked your arm off, but um, um, no, it's been a good. very, Go very uh, right. um, passionate uh, uh, week filled with, um, well, let's the most challenging <laughs> chapter I've ever written. I've been doing this now for 21 years, and there's nothing that compares to the uh, the fifth chapter of, uh, of now volume two of Babel. Uh, so yeah. I, if I have an excuse, it's uh, well, it's been a uh, it's been an interesting week uh, dealing with this. And you know what's interesting too is that yeah. is that it's mm-hmm. it's so unexpected to see how bad this book is. I rewrote the first chapter uh, four times. Yeah. I rewrote the second um, chapter three times. I rewrote the uh, third and fourth chapter twice. Now, fortunately, I only had to write the fifth chapter once because I don't think it would be in me to go after it again. But, but uh, oh, my. It's, um, you're just not expecting anything to be this bad. No. But, anyway, it no. is, uh, it's important that it's we uh, reveal years. the good and the bad. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. tragedy, yeah. All right, my friends. Have a uh, wonderful Shabbat. We'll look forward to being with you uh, next time. We'll continue to make progress as we jump into the uh, third chapter of Hosha, uh, who is the most important of every prophet for Yehudim to listen to because he tells you God's perspective now and tomorrow. May Yahweh bless you all. Good night. Mm-hmm. Good night, Shabbat shalom, y'all. Good night.